Acts chapter 9. Let's back it up and start right at the beginning of the chapter. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Fathers, we revisit the story now of of Saul's transformation, of his conversion to the gospel, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that there will be transformation in our hearts as well. I ask, Lord, both that there will be conversion from death into life, but also, Lord, sanctification from life to life, from glory to glory. And we ask that you will continue to work on us, to make us effective vessels of yours in these last days until, Lord Jesus, you should call us home. I pray that we not take these things lightly, Father. I pray this would not be another Bible study, another worship service, another filling of an hour and a half or two hours on a Sunday morning. I ask, Father... That the reality of these things would hit us like a ton of bricks. Shake us, Father, from our slumber if we are slumbering. Invigorate us to the task at hand. Prepare us to go out and spread the gospel message. We know the days are short. Father, I pray that we will live that way in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, teach us now. We pray. Amen. Picture a man who had it all. A man living the life by worldly standards. Wealth, health, family, respect, notoriety. The Bible calls him the greatest of all the sons of the East. And I'm talking about Job. Chapter 1, verse 3. And then he lost it all. Even his wife came along and condemned him, saying, you still hold fast your integrity, curse God and die. Nice lady, really. (laughs) And in Job chapter 13, verse 26, Job wrote the following, quite truly, you make me to inherit the iniquities of my youth. (laughs) Anybody ever feel like the sins of your youth have caught up with you? You put my feet in the stocks and watch all my paths. You set a limit for the soles of my feet. While I am decaying like a rotten thing, like a garment that is moth-eaten. As Job sat there in the ashes with the sores and dying. Job was in a bad place. So I think we can cut him a little bit of slack. But I prefer Paul's take on the whole issue. Paul, who later wrote in 2 Corinthians 4.16, Therefore we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. The older I get, the more that verse means to me. Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Outside, inside. Picture of another man living the life, primed for greatness in Israel, ambitious, driven until he lost it all, until ultimately Paul would call it rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. Paul was no different than you, no different than me. He was just carried along a road that he did not expect. 
He was challenged and used of the Lord, by the Lord, for the Lord in his life in dramatic ways that you could be used. I should be used. He learned the difference between living for the outside and living the life inside. Paul thought he was living the life until he came to truly live the life. Outside, you all know this, we cannot stop the decay. But inside, through Jesus Christ, we are being renewed every day. Hallelujah. And Isaiah said it this way, Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. And I want to talk to you this morning about the inner man and the renewal that takes place. But i got to give you a warning. And perhaps you're all too familiar with this, that while the inner man is being transformed, the outer world often has a hard time buying it. Like the transformational work that God was doing in the heart of Job, his wife, his friends, they could not see it. And any time a life is transformed by Jesus and enters into this day-by-day renewal, those who know the old you are the ones who have the hardest time accepting the change. Who do you think you are? I know you when we used to do such and such. I knew you back when. You're not fooling anyone with this Christian stuff. And so the world doesn't want to accept the transformation. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? I'm being honest. Transformation is our testimony. The change in you is the testimony of Jesus. Don't shy away from that. Don't say, oh, well, yeah, you know, but I, I'm, you know, it's just become real important. Don't, don't shy away. Yeah, I am different. Yes, I did those things. No, I'm not proud of them. But right now, I'm being changed daily. I am being transformed from glory to glory. Want to hear about that? Amen. Are you proud of the old stuff that we used to do? Did you like the old me the way I was? I love the old James Taylor song. I was a mean old man. I was an ornery cuss. I was a dismal den. I made an awful fuss. Ever since my world began, and it is thus and thus... I was a nasty tyke who was hard to like. (laughs) But I'm being changed, renewed day by day. And so it was with Saul. He departed Jerusalem under the power and the authority of the high priest. He enters Damascus under the power and the authority of the great high priest, Jesus Christ. He leaves one city one way and enters another city another way. He is now under a different authority. Now we're going to pick it up in verse 10 and continue on in the story and consider this idea of renewal, what it truly means, as we see it in the life of Saul. But before we get back to Saul, we have to note another disciple. We're introduced to a man named Ananias. Now there was a disciple at Damascus, verse 10, named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. Which is always the right answer. Here I am, Lord, he says. Now, Ananias. Ananias wasn't an apostle. Ananias was a man of no reputation. We knew nothing about Ananias up until Acts chapter 9, verse 10. We will know very little about Ananias at all. As far as we know, he wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a pastor. He was just a parishioner. Just... A churchgoer? Just a disciple? Don't ever accept the label just. Just because you happen to sit and listen on a Sunday morning. There is nothing to that. You are not just a follower of Jesus Christ. And so here comes Ananias. It's a common Jewish name. You've heard the name before. Ananias and Sapphira. A little more infamous, remember? Who lied to the Holy Spirit. And you would think if someone was crafting a tale, why would they use the same name twice? 
As typically is done in fiction stories, you've got Frodo and Bilbo and Sam and Mary and Pippin and on and on it goes. All these names to remember, if you're reading a good fiction, a good fiction writer is going to give you interesting and intricate names. But here we just have another Ananias, a common Jewish name. I think it lends credibility to the scriptures that there aren't all kinds of made up names, but they're just the names of the people, the common names of the day. And so this commonly named disciple in Damascus is called by God in his wisdom. This, this common saint is called on to lay his hands on arguably the greatest apostle of them all. Though Paul throughout his life would argue that he's the least. But I wonder as I read that God calls Ananias... Shouldn't it have been Peter? You know, shouldn't it have been at least John who can run faster than Peter? We know that, so maybe John would have been a good choice. (laughs) Wouldn't have you have thought that God, if he was going to anoint the Apostle Paul, call this great writer of New Testament Scripture, this missionary of missionaries, this faithful man, shouldn't it have been the first pope who laid his hands on him? Why Ananias? <laughs> Why Ananias? One reason. Get your theological minds out for this one. He was available. Peter's down in Joppa dealing with stuff. John's back in Jerusalem dealing with stuff. Ananias was there. He was available. It's as simple as that. But he was not only available in person, he was available in heart. His immediate response to the vision of the Lord is, Here I am, Lord. First one with his hand up as the role is being called. Ananias, yes, Lord. Ananias, here I am, Lord. And in verse 11, the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, For he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So note this. God speaks to both Ananias and to Saul in a vision. Interesting. He is validating here what he was doing in and through Saul by speaking to Saul in a vision about Ananias and by speaking to Ananias in a vision about Saul. And as the story would go out, the church would recognize this. Both men, separate and apart from each other, who had no idea about each other. Well, Ananias knew something of Saul. But both men have separate visions, calling them to come together, calling Ananias to come to Saul. As the story would spread among the church, people would begin to realize, wow, this isn't something Saul made up. Ask Ananias. Go see what he heard, what he learned. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Peter had already quoted the prophet Joel from Joel 2.28. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Now, the difference between dreams and visions is simply whether or not you're awake. Dreams happen when you're asleep. Visions happen, tend to happen in the waking state. And the Lord uses visions to confirm His will. Wait, Rick, that sounds like you're speaking present tense. Are you saying that people still have visions? That God still uses visions? I absolutely believe He does. Why? Because there are those who will say, no, no, this is just an early church thing. This is limited to the first century church. These dreams, these visions, these power miracles, it's a first century church thing. Problem is that the very context of the prophecy that Peter quotes from the book of Joel runs right through the church age into the great tribulation, which has not happened. Therefore, if the young men will see visions and the old men will dream dreams and all these things will take place and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and Joel then describes that running right up to the great tribulation, then we are still in that age. And dreams and visions are still being used by the Lord. Well, but how do we know if someone's not going off the deep end? 
We have the Word. We test everything by the Word of God. We make judgment, sound doctrinal judgment on dreams and visions and things that people claim to hear if they are in alignment with the Word of God. And if they're not, guess what? Not from God. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to bring a new gospel. Paul made that so abundantly clear in Galatians 1.8 that there are no more gospels, that there would be no more gospels. There would be not be another word given. And I would say to Mormon friends, another word would not be given. I would say to Muslims, another word would not be given. Oh, but your word is corrupt. Is God not able to keep his word pure? Is God, once having given his word and set his seal upon his word, unable to keep his word for his people? Well, God is speaking to his people today. If we will listen, if more hearts would, like Ananias, just say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. So Jesus directs Ananias to Straight Street. It's a great name for a street on which to be saved. Straight Street. A street, by the way, that still runs straight up the middle of Damascus today. You can walk on Straight Street. I I wouldn't advise it with the whole ISIS thing going on, but you could. (laughs) Straight Street is still there. How appropriate. For Saul, like John the Baptist before him, would soon be a voice calling Isaiah 40, verse 3, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's our calling too. To call the world to straight living. To the straight truth. To call the world to be straight biblically. To be straight physically. To be straight intellectually, to be straight sexually, to be straight in all of these things, to walk on the street that is called straight. What a contrast. Here in the vision of Ananias, we learn from Jesus that Saul, blinded and fasting, is now praying. Saul is praying. He left Jerusalem breathing threats and murder. He now rests in Damascus praying. What was Saul praying? We don't know. We can't say for sure. If I were to make a guess, I would say Saul is deep in the prayer of repentance. Why? First thing to understand about renewal. Renewal is activated in repentance. You want to enter into a life being renewed day by day, transformed. It is activated in and by repentance. Remember, this was Saul, a man fiercely committed to Adonai, to the Jewish way of thinking, whatever that meant, until he realized, until he learned he had been charging blindly down the wrong road. And by the way, sincerity and faith is never enough. You can be a sincere Mormon. You can be a sincere Jehovah's Witness. You can be a sincere Muslim. But sincerity is not what counts. Jesus is who counts. And only faith in Jesus is a faith that can save you for eternity. Sincerity cannot, no matter how sincere you are. And so here's Saul, absolutely sincere in his faith, but absolutely wrong in his treatment of God's people. It may be part of the reason why Paul responds so immediately to Jesus in repentance that his heart would do the right thing by God, desired to do right by God, just didn't know how to get there. And so Paul is a man deep in repentance. Honestly, gang, I think sadly we have developed a very shallow view of repentance today. What we understand repentance to be all about. You know what? It's not about paying back the wrong. You can't do it. You cannot pay back all the wrong that you have done in your life. That's not repentance. And repentance isn't just about wallowing in guilt. That's called regret. Repentance. Listen, David got it. David said in Psalm 51 verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. 
For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And then he says this, and this is true repentance. David says, against you, you only have I sinned. Repentance is the full-blown recognition that your sin is an eternal sin against a holy and eternal God. That the wrongness in my life, though it has affected and impacted other beings, other humans around me, my wrong is against Him. And my repentance is turning toward Him, recognizing that wrong. That is real Repentance against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Why does it matter how we define repentance? Because repentance, a heart turned toward God, recognizing that the wrong done was done toward God, repentance penetrates rebellion. Repentance cracks open the outer shell of a sinner's hard heart. And until we've truly repented, just feeling bad about something is never enough because it won't change the heart. It won't soften the heart that's become hard. And I have seen this happen time and time again where a person has felt bad about what they've done but not truly repented for it. Skirted the issue. So that they not be found out by other people what's truly taken place. But real repentance throws open the heart and says, this is what I've done. This is where I've come from. And I stand before a holy God, sorrowful for my sin. Only then can renewal begin. Until the heart is broken and softened, Renewal cannot take place because the heart, it's it's like it just bounces right off the heart exterior. Paul says in Romans 2 verse 4, Do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepented heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation in the righteous judgment of God. You want a heart renewed, you want to enter into transformation, it starts with repentance. And so we find Saul praying there in Damascus. And Ananias responds to the Lord, verse 13, Lord, (laughs) I have heard from many about this man. How much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Now at this point, Ananias is still a one-dimensional disciple. We know nothing about him other than he's been called on by the Lord. Listen to how Paul describes him later. In Acts 22, verse 12, Paul calls him a man who was devout by the standard of the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived in Damascus. Do you know what that means? He's a pious, law-abiding, favorable Jew turned follower of Jesus Christ. You know what Ananias, what that made Ananias in the eyes of Saul? Public enemy number one. Ananias is the guy that Saul is going after. Ananias is the personification. He's a walking target in Damascus. This is the guy... That Saul would go into the synagogue looking for. The guy who would speak the name Yeshua. And the moment he did, Saul would nab him. This is a man who walking out of synagogue on Shabbat would be captured by Saul's henchmen. Because this pious Jew is now also a follower of Jesus. Exactly the kind of person Saul was gunning for. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he will suffer or how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias is now in the position of having to take God at his word. You could say he's about to take his life in his hands. Well, he's not. 
He's about to put his life in God's hands. All he knows is Jesus said, go. And so Ananias will go. But look at verse 15 again. The Lord says, go, for he, that is Saul, is a chosen instrument of mine. So interesting the type of people God chooses. Those you would not expect. I remember when I was first, first went back out to California, working in a church there in Southern California, and as a youth pastor and walking across the church campus one morning, and I saw someone who was very familiar to me. His name was Steve. Steve was the captain of the drum line when we were in high school. A mean guy. Mean guy. In drum line rehearsals, if we didn't pay attention to him, he threw drumsticks at us. I bore on my body the marks of those drumsticks from time to time. I didn't like Steve much. I didn't know anything about his life. Oftentimes when someone is hard-hearted, they're having a bad time or they're in a bad space in life. But there he was walking across the campus of our church, and I went up to him and I said, Steve. And he goes, Rick. I said, how you doing? And he goes, fine, how you healing? (laughs) And he apologized for his meanness, and we went on to talk about how in the years after high school, and it had only been about 10 years at that point, how Jesus got a hold of him and changed his life. And I was shocked when I saw him. God uses interesting people. God grabs a hold of those that you cannot believe that he would grab a hold of. But this Saul is now God's chosen instrument. And note, the Lord says he's going to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. Second thing about renewal, you need to understand that renewal answers our reason. Renewal answers our reason for being. Our reason for existence, it is not until we embark upon the way of renewal that we finally and fully understand why we are here on this earth. In other words, until you are born again, you are not living at all. You're living in the shadows. You're living, you're you're walking the way of death. You are not truly living, you're just existing. Now, someone might hear that and say, that is so arrogant of you Christians. Hey, I'm not the one who made the change. Jesus is. The only reason why there is change in my life and in my heart is because of the power of the cross. It's not anything that I did to deserve or earn this position, this place, this life. But I'll tell you what, I've been born again. And now that I'm born again, I know why I'm here. Until you've been born again, you don't know why you're here. Yes, I do. I'm a financer, Rick. Well, yeah, but you're miserable, aren't you? Well, I'm a musician. You're miserable. Well, I'm this, I'm that. You're never going to find fulfillment until you're born again because renewal answers our reason. This, verse 15, is Saul's great commission. Suddenly now, the meaning of his life comes bearing down upon him. You are going to speak the name of Jesus to Gentiles, to kings, to the sons of Israel. It's remarkable. And listen to this. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20. Paul would later write to the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as one without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that I might by all means save some. I can do all things or I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I might become a fellow partaker of it. God says, I'm going to send you to Gentiles. I'm going to send you before kings. I'm going to send you to the sons of Israel. And Paul says, I will be whoever I need to be wherever I am for the sake of the gospel. To the Jews, I will be a Jew. To the Gentiles, I will understand the thinking of a Gentile. And to kings, I will go before kings. I'm going to become all things to all people. And you might say, so phony? So false? Listen, Paul is not a chameleon Paul is a man of compassion. And there's a huge difference. 
Paul's not saying I'm going to lie about who I am. Paul's saying I'm going to seek to understand everybody that I'm sent to. And if it's to Jews, I'm going to use all of my Jewish background to help me understand where they're coming from. And I will preach to them there. To the Gentiles, I'm going to seek to understand them in such a way that as I present the gospel, they can hear me. All things to all people. For Paul, it would mean using everything at his disposal with Jews, Gentiles, and even kings to preach Jesus. Because you see, Saul finally knows why he's here. Saul's life finally makes sense because renewal answers reason. And the more I am renewed day by day, the more confident I am in the calling on my life by Jesus. And that goes for every single person called by him. Everyone has given their life to him. Your reason for being here is not your job. It is not your education. It is not your family. It is not your ambition. Your reason for being here is singular. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and Christ alone is why you are here. Now here's where the road out of Damascus can become dangerous. Look at verse 16 again. Jesus says, For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. That's not a veiled threat. Oh, don't worry, Ananias. Saul will get his. <laughs> I'm going to take him out. Bad. He's going to have a rough row. You think he's you know, done some harmful things? Just wait till I get through with him. That's not what Jesus is saying. It's not a threat. It is a vital truth. Number three, about renewal. Renewal alerts the rod of persecution. Renewal alerts the rod of persecution. A person truly living in the life of renewal is a threat, is a danger to the enemy, and the rod of persecution will come. If you're truly living a renewed life, as Paul said, 2 Timothy 3.12, indeed, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Know what that means? It means if you live your life looking exactly like you used to live your life, you're not going to be persecuted because no one's really going to care. But if you begin to live godly in Christ Jesus, if you begin to recognize as we're talking about that the sole reason for your existence is Jesus Christ and Him alone, if you begin to live that way, You will become a threat, and the rod of persecution will land on your back. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my sake. And Paul should know. His persecution was intense. 2 Corinthians 11, he details this. He recounts being imprisoned, beaten with rods. Paul, listen, Paul took the 39 lashes five times. I wonder what his back looked like. He was stoned and left for dead. He was shipwrecked three different times, including spending a day and night in the deep. Sleepless nights, he described hunger, thirst, cold, exposure, and above all, he has in this little nugget, the daily pressure of concern for all the churches. I think about that from time to time because God has only given me the concern for this fellowship. And my concern for this fellowship is great. Cheryl will tell you there are times it is all consuming. You wouldn't know it. (laughs) But there are times you're all I'm thinking about. Our fellowship is all I'm considering. And it can be quite a weight. But here's Saul who has concern for every church that he ever planted. Every group of people that he ever had interaction with. The church of Thessalonica that he got to spend three Sabbaths with before he had to leave. Try planting a church in three weeks. And this was Saul's life. But did you catch what Jesus said? He said... I will show him how much he must suffer. You know what that means? Saul would see it ahead of time. I'm so thankful I can't see the future. I am so glad that it's not laid out before me. 
Now, I haven't had a hard life. Honestly, comparatively to Saul, I got nothing on Saul. But if I knew the kind of struggles that I would have had as a pastor, I never would have gotten into ministry. If he had showed me ahead of time how much I was going to have to suffer for his namesake, and again, I've suffered very little. But Saul would see it all. Jesus would show him in his preparation, in his training for ministry, all that was about to take place, all that was ahead of him, and guess what? He followed him anyway. Why? (laughs) Well, because when you see Jesus, you cannot turn back. When you encounter Christ like Saul did, there is no turning around. And I promise you this, for all the suffering that Paul went through in his life, he had not a single regret. He was able to say in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, and in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but also all those who have loved His appearing. Listen, for Saul it was all about appearances. The appearances, that is, of Jesus. His ministry began with the appearance of Jesus. His ministry would end with the appearance of Jesus calling him home. His entire ministry was about loving the appearance of Jesus. Looking forward to the appearance of Jesus. Man, I saw him in Damascus. I saw him once when he called us into Macedonia. I will see him again. And this is the the definition of Saul's entire life. The beginning and the end of his road was about the appearance of Jesus. And by the way, so it is for all who love his appearing. Do you love his appearing? Can you say, I can't wait for his appearing? See, those who love his appearing would hear me say something like, Hey, this is the fourth blood moon and who knows what it means, but we might be going home sooner as opposed to later. Those who love his appearing would go, Yes! Not that there's something in the blood moon. I don't know. That's between God and Israel. (laughs) That's up to the Lord. And if He's using those signs in the heavens, hallelujah, I'm not going to take stock in those. I'm just going to be ready because I love His appearing. And if He should take us home today before halftime, hallelujah. Rick, are you going to be done before halftime? Yeah, we're getting there. Verse 17. So Ananias departed, and he entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the more I know of Ananias, the more I love this guy. He is one of the true unsung heroes of the faith. He is the obedient catalyst for the ministry of Saul, of Paul. As I said before, he put his life in the hands of the Lord, and now he lays his hands on Saul. By the way, that's interesting to me. When we do that, when we put our lives in God's hands, it frees our hands to be about his business. When we put our lives in His hands. But when we don't, when we hang on to things with our hands, when we stress and worry and bemoan our life's situation, clinging with our hands and not giving it into the hands of the Lord, our hands are no longer free to do the work that He's called us to. But Ananias would have hands free to lay on the shoulders of Paul because he put his life in the hands of God. And the first word, I love this, The first word that Saul, in his blindness, would hear from this emissary of the persecuted church is brother. Brother. Because, number four, renewal attracts reception. Renewal attracts reception. Have you noted that, that you tend to know when someone is a believer? You may be sitting in an airport waiting for a plane and you get into a conversation and you just know that you know this person's a believer. There's something different here. This is a person who's been renewed as early as this morning. (laughs) 
Renewal attracts reception into the family of God. One of the greatest blessings of the church is the church. What a blessing it is to be together and to have each other and to receive one another in the name of Jesus as those whose lives are being renewed day by day. That I can look at you, you can look at me, and we can say, though we're not perfect, we're being renewed, we're being changed. And if I'm an idiot today, maybe not so much tomorrow. (laughs) And so we can, as Paul wrote, love without hypocrisy. Because we're honest about our flaws, our failures, our sin. Hey, I'm being renewed. I'm being transformed. We can abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, Romans 12, 9 and 10. We can be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. Because renewal attracts reception. I receive you, you receive me, because together we are being renewed. We are being changed. But again, Saul, he doesn't just hear Ananias call him bro. He feels the hands of Ananias resting gently on his shoulders. Contact. Now don't miss the intimacy of this moment for Saul. Ananias lays his hands on him and not like Saul was going to lay his hands on Ananias and the believers. Ananias comes in there and lays his hands on him. What what is the deal with laying on of hands? For those of you who don't like the touchy-feely folk in the church. You know, there are those of you who walk up to each other, Jake's one of them, and say, Brother's got a hug. And then there are those who are like, Yeah, love you, bro. Give me my space. I need my space. And then we come to this laying on of hands thing. Oh, no, if I go up and get prayed for, they're going to lay hands on me. Hope they're using like some cleaner or something in this germ freaked out world we live in what is about the laying on of hands why does God prescribe this contact contact yes we are to be spiritually minded but we are still physical beings and the Lord wants us to make contact with each other as we receive new believers into the fellowship contact as we love one another in this fellowship contact It's contact, but it's also something else. It's conveyance. The laying on of hands is conveyance. Ananias here is not only making contact in the name of Jesus, but he is conveying the spirit of Jesus. He is the conduit through which God would pour his spirit out on Saul. Now please understand, it is not because of the holy righteousness of Ananias that he is able to do this. It's because God told him to. And so this simple parishioner lays his hands on Paul, on Saul, and Saul receives the Holy Spirit. We have a word we use for that sometimes. It's kind of a theological word. It's a high and mighty word, impartation. We now give the impartation of the Spirit. It just means to give, to convey. What does God really need Ananias for? He doesn't. And that's the amazing point. He doesn't need our help, but he invites it. He involves us. It's it's a remarkable supernatural partnership. And what he called Ananias to do is the same that he calls us to do one with another. Contact, conveyance. We get to make contact and he does the conveyance of his spirit. And that's why we lay hands on one another when we pray. That's why last week, and I hated missing it, That the shepherds laid hands on Jake and anointed him as a pastor of this church and into ministry. I'm so proud of you, Jake. I didn't get to say that before the fellowship, but I am so proud of you. In the four years, four and a half that he's been serving with us, what a man of God, filled with the Spirit, powerful with the Word that he has become. It was an honor for our shepherds to lay hands on him. But it was contact and it was conveyance. And this is why Jesus involves Ananias rather than just dealing with Saul on the road to Damascus. You know he could have done that. Saul, you're persecuting me. Knock it off. (laughs) 
You lay hands on my people, feel this. Oh. You know? He could have gotten face to face with Saul and said, you are going to be my instrument. I'm going to show you suffering like you've never experienced. I'm going to empower you in remarkable ways. And you're going to go to kings and Gentiles and Jews alike. You're going to do it all. So he doesn't say a word. He just says, go into Damascus and we'll, we'll let you know. And then he sends Ananias. And he didn't have to do it that way. He never has to use me. He never has to use you. He chooses to because he loves you. And he loves me. And he wants us involved in contact and conveyance, the laying on of hands, the sharing of the gospel. Verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. This really impresses Naomi. She heard the story and she came home and said it like three times. Dad, scales came off of his eyes. She said it just like that too. Came off of his eyes. And he regained his sight and he got up and he was baptized and he took food and was strengthened. Did you catch that? The laying on of hands, brother Saul, he receives the Holy Spirit. And then he gets water baptized. I got to throw a flag on this play. I'm going to need a ruling. I decided I want to have a yellow flag for staff meetings. I think that would be so fun. No, I'm sorry, Brian. I, I can't. What are, you, what are you talking about? What, what's this about? Wouldn't that be great? What is happening here? He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he's water baptized, and that's all out of order. Or is it? At Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, they were baptized, and then they received the Holy Spirit. In Samaria, Acts chapter 8, they were baptized and the Holy Spirit did not come until the apostles came down from Jerusalem and laid hands on them, the Samaritans, thus affirming God's work and his reception of Samaritans and with Jews in this Christian movement. On the Gaza Road, Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian is baptized and we hear nothing about the Holy Spirit except that he raptures Philip up into the air and takes him 20 miles away. At Caesarea... In Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentile Cornelius and his whole entire clan before they're baptized. And Peter, back on his heels, goes, well, I guess we ought to let him get baptized. It's my translation. And here in Acts chapter 9, Saul receives the Holy Spirit before baptism. Please understand, and I love that the Lord does this in the book of Acts. It is not about the order. It is about the obedience. And you might say, well, I received the Holy Spirit. Why should I be baptized? Because the Lord told you to. Well, I was baptized. What's this about receiving the Holy Spirit? I'm not sure about that. Receive the Holy Spirit. Obedience to the things of God. That's what matters. It is not my tradition that matters. It is not my <laughs> denominational history that matters. It's obedience to the call of God on your heart. Verse 19, continuing now, for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. They were amazed, confounded by him. Literally, that word in the Greek, existanto, means they were beside themselves. The Jews in Damascus. They were beside, they were standing there beside themselves. They couldn't figure out what was going on. They were absolutely astonished because Saul came to arrest people in Damascus for doing exactly what he's doing. Preaching the gospel. Talking about Jesus. Now he's in the synagogues. He came with letters of condemnation. Now he's delivering a letter of reconciliation. 
Everything is flipped upside down. The Jews are astonished. And I'm sure, I am absolutely convinced that the saints were delighted. As we are any time the truth is being proclaimed. Hey, number five, jot this down. This is the most theological statement I'm going to make of the morning. Renewal acts like rocket fuel. (laughs) Renewal acts like rocket fuel. Look at Paul take off. He blasts off. The word here is immediately he began to proclaim Jesus. Immediately he begins speaking the gospel. He didn't go to a new believer's class. (laughs) Now a new believer's class is a great idea. Very important in shoring up belief and coming to understand what it is we know. But you know what? Paul did not wait a minute. Why? Because he had seen Jesus. And this is what happens when you encounter Jesus. You start living the life immediately. Immediately. And Paul will later write in 1 Corinthians 9.16, If I preach the gospel, I've got nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. Rocket fuel. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Now, maybe you felt that way before. Passionate, ready to go, gunning for Jesus. You can't wait to share. But perhaps the fuel of renewal seems to have run dry. So what do you do? Three words. Fill her up. <laughs> Fill her up. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is getting a process. It is ongoing. It is never stopping. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And you might say, well, that sounds good. Fill her up. Keep going. But how do you get the gas cap off? How do I get back to that place? Listen, it's not rocket science. It's very simple. You continually devote yourself to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. You be faithful in attendance, not so your name can get checked off on the rolls, but so that you can continue in the process of renewal. If you lack the energy... To bring the gospel to a lost world is because you need more of these. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, the prayer. Stay the course. Remain faithful in simplicity. And I promise you, you will be strong in the word. You will be energized in this season. But back off and you will find yourself weakening. The less time you spend with other believers the less you find yourself talking about Jesus. The less time you are in His Word, the less you really have to say when the subject comes up. The less you worship, the less you see Jesus on a daily basis. And we're talking about renewal, which is a day-by-day issue. Number six, watch this. Renewal opens the heart to revelation. Opens the heart to Revelation. Verse 23. When many days had elapsed. Stop right there. Many days. Try three years. Because right here at the beginning of verse 23. And I believe this is where the gap is. There is a three year interlude. During which Saul leaves Damascus. And then three years later returns to Damascus. And it happens soon after his explosive transformation. How do you know? He writes this in Galatians chapter 1 verse 16. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. In the new believers class I was talking about, Paul didn't go. He didn't even sign up. He didn't rush from Damascus back to Jerusalem to meet with Peter and the apostles and be trained up in the ways of the church. Catch up on those three years. That's interesting. The three years that the other apostles have with the Lord. Huh. No, rather Paul says, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem, Galatians 1.17, to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia, and I returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him for 15 days. Three years In Arabia, what happened there, Saul? 
2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, Saul said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. The third heaven? In Jewish thinking, the third heaven is where God resides. And Paul is speaking, most of us believe, about himself. And if we can put this together, what we gather is that Paul was given a three-year training program by Jesus himself. Where's all this stuff in Romans and, and, and First and Second Thessalonians and the Corinthian letters and the Philippian letters? Where's all this come from, this, this understanding of, of Christian doctrine? That comes from the Lord. Through a man who was hand-trained by Jesus to bring the truth of the gospel and to express it in terms of the church itself. And we will see that as we get into the letters of Paul. They are stunning. And by the way, not in the least bit contradictory of anything that Jesus taught. They fit perfectly. A man who had revelation. Renewal is revelatory. (laughs) That's the word. Revelatory, And so Paul would pray this about you, about me, Ephesians 1.17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Listen, brothers and sisters, don't settle for what you know. Pray for revelation. By the Word of Christ, by the Spirit of Christ, to know what He wants you to know in the moment as you are renewed day by day. Don't expect another gospel. Of course, don't expect a plan B. All revelation is secured by this Word. But it's only been plan A. From the very beginning to the very end, one plan of God, that is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 23, quickly, let's finish this. So when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were always watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples, his disciples? He's already got disciples. They took him by night and they let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. Saul is already in trouble and already has disciples. How many disciples do you have? What? I don't have it. I have a fish, you know, and a puppy. Disciples? Why not? Isn't the great commission that we go into all the world and make disciples? Oh, not disciples of you, disciples of me, but disciples of Jesus Christ. What is up with us in the church that we don't all have disciples? We should. People with whom we've shared the gospel and now we're training in the gospel because we haven't told them about Jesus and walked away. Saul already had him. Thankfully, because he needed someone to lower him out of the city in the basket, right? Verse 26, when he had come to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas, good old Barnabas, son of encouragement, took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews. These are not now the Hellenistic Jews of the church. These are just the cultural elites among the Jews. And they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. Now check this out. This man whose life has been renewed. The Jews don't want him. The saints are afraid of him. The cultural elites, cultural elites want him dead. Because, note this, number seven, last one, renewal aggravates resistance. Renewal aggravates 
resistance. Why is that? Why is it that a life renewed in this world, in this culture, is so offensive to culture? Why is it that someone simply wanting to live by the constructs of Christian faith is such a danger, is so upsetting, is so problematic for those around him, around her? Why does renewal aggravate resistance? Very simply, listen, because renewal is a supernatural work of God. And being a supernatural work, it raises a spiritual resistance. There are those in the world who resist you as a believer, not even knowing why. They don't know why. They just, it's a spirit thing, a battle raging. Others know exactly why and intentionally dodge all things that are divine and true. But for you and me, being renewed day by day, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the rulers and the powers and the world forces of this darkness and the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. I know you're familiar with the verse, but this needs to affect our thinking when we look at the world around us. My enemies are not those of Planned Parenthood. Though what's going on in that organization is heinous and should be stopped and should not be funded by taxpayer money, shouldn't be funded by any money, this is not the enemies that I fight. These are the ones who have been captured by the enemy. My battle is not against flesh and blood. My battle is not against those in Oak Harbor or Anacortes who would resist the movement, the work of God in this fellowship or others. No, my heart goes out to those who are lost. My heart goes out to those who are cantankerous and resistant to me. Because I'm not fighting them, I'm fighting for them. And it's a completely different mentality. You might say, how can we surmount what we can't even see if our battle is a spiritual battle? How do we fight that? Hey, we walk by faith, not by sight. And trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the beauty of our involvement in the plan of God. It really all comes down to this. If we face resistance here, we go there. If we get kicked out of Damascus, we go to Jerusalem. If they won't let us stay in Jerusalem, we'll go to Caesarea. Things don't work out well in Caesarea, we'll go to Tarsus. And we will continue going and going and going. And verse 31 tells us, So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. And you can be sure Saul had much to do with that. You see, every time they booted him out of one city, he just went to another one and started the gospel there. And when he got kicked out of it, Paul was kicked out of every decent city in the entire Middle East and just kept going. Why? Because our transformation is our testimony. Because the changed lives that Jesus has wrought within each one of us, that is the witness. And we walk by faith and we are fueled by His passion and it becomes our witness. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. And there will be resistance, plenty of it. And there will be the rod of persecution. And some days, more than other days, you're going to feel the external decay going on. You're going to sense the experience of Job on the outside. But renewal is on the inside. You see, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves afflicted in every way but not crushed perplexed but not despairing persecuted but not forsaken struck down but not destroyed always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus 
may be manifested in our body. That's living the life. Do you desire to live the life to which Jesus has called you?